turn to the book of Ruth. The title we've given this one is Ruth, the Great Grandmother of King David. Uh, you'll see why that's pretty profound as we look into this. Uh, go through the book. How many of you have read Ruth recently? I don't know if you, if you take advantage of the, as you know, we're coming up on this. There's some really interesting things that go on in Ruth, aren't they? When you look at the customs that they had back then, we'll talk about some of that. Stand with me if you would. Uh, we're going to read chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. These are 22. This is the last verses in the book, uh, and it's very fascinating that they, uh, this, this becomes sort of a bridge, even more so, that the book, it's, even though it happens in the book of Judges. We said last week the book of Judges is a bridge toward the, uh, the monarchy. Uh, this, is, this is more obviously a bridge. The last word in the book is the word David, the name David. Follow along, if you will. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amimadab. Amimadab, Amimadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Simon. Simon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. You know, genealogies, sometimes we get bogged down in them, uh, but they're always significant, and, you, and the significance of this is, is shouts at us that this woman who was not of Jewish extraction, she's a Moabitess from the, from the area of Moab, is grafted in just as Rahab, just as Tamar, grafted in to the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is the inerrant infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let's dive into it tonight. Thank you. Please be seated. I want us to, um, I'll, I'll just give a little brief introduction, and then we're going to watch a video, uh, the Gospel Project summary of Ruth. But I, want, I found this, I thought this was, was a very good description. Ruth is a beautiful, and it's this quotes, interlude of love set in the period of the judges in Israel, which we looked at last week, which was an era marked by immorality, idolatry, and war. This heartwarming devo story of devotion and faithfulness records the life of Ruth, a Moabite widow who leaves her homeland to live with her widowed Jewish mother-in-law in Bethlehem. God honors her commitment by guiding her to the field of Boaz, who is a, a near kinsman to Naomi, where she gathers grain and eventually finds a husband. The book closes with a brief genealogy in which Boaz's name is prominent as the great-grandfather of King David, through whom would come the Christ. Let's watch the Gospel Project video summary, and then we'll get into the, I'll do my own survey and, and outlines. The Book of Ruth. It's a brilliant work of theological art, and it invites us to reflect on the question of how God is involved in the day-to-day -day joys and hardships of our lives. There are three main characters in the book, Naomi the widow, Ruth the Moabite, and Boaz the Israelite farmer. And their story is told in four chapters that are beautifully designed. Let's just dive in and see how this all unfolds. Chapter 1 opens with this line, in the days when the judges ruled. And it reminds us of the very dark and difficult days from the book of Judges. And here we meet an Israelite family in Bethlehem, struggling to survive through a famine. And so in search of food, they move on to the land of Moab, Israel's ancient enemy. And there the father of the family dies, and the sons marry two Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. And then the sons, they die too. And so they leave only Naomi and these new daughters-in-law. And so Naomi, she has no reason to stay anymore. And so she tells her new daughters-in-law that she's moving back home. And Naomi, she knows that the life of an unmarried foreign widow in Israel is going to be very hard. And so she compels the women to stay behind. Orpah agrees. But Ruth does not. She shows remarkable loyalty to Naomi. And she says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will become my people, and your God will become my God. And so the two of them return to Israel together. And the chapter concludes with Naomi changing her name to Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew. And she laments her tragic fate. 
Chapter two begins with Naomi and Ruth discussing where they're going to find food. And it just so happens to be the beginning of the barley harvest. And so Ruth goes out to look for food. And it just so happens that she ends up picking grain in the field of a man named Boaz, who just so happens to be Naomi's relative. We're told that Boaz is a man of noble character. And he notices Ruth. And so after finding out more about her story, he shows remarkable generosity to her. He makes these special provisions so that the immigrant Ruth can gather grain in his field. And in doing so, Boaz is actually obeying an explicit command of the Torah to show generosity to the immigrant and the poor. Boaz is so impressed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi, he prays for her that God will reward her for her boldness. So Ruth comes home that day, and Naomi finds out that she met Boaz, and she is thrilled. She says Boaz is their family redeemer. Now, This family redeemer thing, this was a cultural practice in Israel where if a man in the family died and he left behind a wife or children or land, it was the family redeemer's responsibility to marry that widow, to take up the land and protect that family. So Naomi, she begins to hope that perhaps there might still be a future for her family. Chapter 3 begins with Naomi and Ruth making a plan to get Boaz to notice their situation. So Ruth is going to stop wearing clothes of a grieving widow, and she's going to show signs that she's available to be married. And so Ruth goes to meet Boaz on the farm that night. And as she approaches, Boaz wakes up, and he's totally startled. And Ruth makes her intentions very clear. She asks if Boaz will redeem Naomi's family and marry her. Boaz is once again amazed by Ruth's loyalty to Naomi and her family, and he calls Ruth a woman of noble character. It's the same term used to describe the woman of Proverbs 31. So Boaz tells Ruth to wait until the next day, and he will redeem both Ruth and Naomi legally before the town elders. And so the chapter ends with Ruth returning to Naomi, and they marvel together at all of these recent events. In chapter 4, it all comes together. It turns out, at the last minute, Boaz discovers there is a family member who's closer to Naomi than he is, and he's actually eligible before him to redeem the family. But at the last second, this family member finds out that he's going to have to marry Ruth, the Moabite, and so he declines. But Boaz, remember, he knows Ruth's true character, and so he acquires the family property of Naomi, and he marries Ruth. Ruth. And so just at the beginning, how Ruth was loyal to Naomi's family, so now Boaz is loyal to Naomi's family as well. The story concludes with a reversal of all of the tragedies from chapter 1. So the death of the husband and the sons is reversed as Ruth is married again and gives birth to a new son, granting joy to Naomi. And this symmetry between the opening and the closing, it's even more remarkable. So remember, the opening tragedy was followed by a great act of loyalty on the part of Ruth. And that is now matched by Boaz's act of loyalty that leads to the family's final restoration. And this symmetry, it highlights the design of the internal chapters as well. So each of the chapters begins with Naomi and Ruth making a plan for their future. And that's followed by a providential meeting between Ruth and Boaz. And each chapter concludes with Naomi and Ruth rejoicing at what's taken place. This story is beautifully designed. And that design actually connects with a really interesting feature of the story. And that's how little God is mentioned. Right? The characters talk about God a few times, but the narrator actually never once mentions God doing anything directly in the story. And that's its brilliance. Because God's providence is at work behind every scene of this story, weaving together the circumstances and choices of all these characters. So Naomi, her tragedy leads her to think that God is punishing her. But actually, the whole story is about God's mission to restore her and her family. And he's doing so through Ruth, through her boldness and loyalty, which brings healing to Naomi's life, but not without Boaz, who's a no-nonsense farmer who's full of generosity and loyalty. And so God uses his integrity combined with Ruth's boldness to save Naomi and her family. And so this story brilliantly explores the interplay of God's purposes and will with human decision and will. God weaves together the faithful obedience of his people to bring about his redemptive purposes in the world. And that leads to the real end of the story. The book of Ruth concludes with a genealogy showing how Boaz and Ruth's son, Oved, 
was the grandfather of King David, from whom came the lineage of the Messiah. And so all of a sudden, these seemingly mundane, ordinary events in this story are woven into God's grand story of redemption for the whole world. And so the book of Ruth invites us to consider how God might be at work in the very ordinary, mundane details of our lives as well. And that's what the book of Ruth is all about. A great uh, visual summary of this brief but powerful story. Uh, remember Abraham was called by God to take his son, his only son, we looked at that when we were looking in Genesis, to the mount and sacrifice him. And Abraham was faithful, following exactly what God told him to do. He gets there prepared if necessary to take the life, as, as the Hebrew writer says, that he, he counted his son as good as dead, and God able to bring him back to life. And then God provided a ram in the thicket. And Abraham called the place Jehovah-Jireh. Uh, on the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, is one of the translations, but, or on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And Jehovah-Jireh is the God who provides. And so you have this this kind of a theme running all the way through this, this book of Ruth. Let's look at it uh, here for a few minutes tonight. It is the story of this virtuous woman. That they pointed out that the, when, uh, when the term worthy or noble shows up in the, in the text, it is the same word uh, asked in Proverbs 31, who can find a virtuous woman? And, and so Ruth is this virtuous woman. Though she's not uh, originally from uh, the Jews, she very quickly has this disposition, and you see it in there. You know, wherever you go, I will go. Where you follow, or where you lead, I will follow. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. It's, this, it's almost a declaration of faith that I will, I will trust in your God. And so uh, she clearly lives above the norm of the day. Remember, this is happening in the midst of the book of Judges. Uh, probably written... Uh, during the reign of David. We'll talk a little more about that uh, in a few minutes. One writer said this. I, I love this contrast. He said, the period, this period in Israel's history was generally a desert of rebellion and immorality, but the story of Ruth stands in contrast as an oasis of integrity and righteousness. She shows a loyal love to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and then when, when she's introduced to him, to her near kinsman, Boaz. The, uh, the book breaks down uh, this way. You have, you have Ruth's love demonstrated, chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 23. And, and within that, the way it's demonstrated is she makes a decision to remain with Naomi. By the way, Orpah makes the choice, and there's nothing wrong with her choice, to stay in Moab and try to find a husband there. And you never hear from Orpah again. And yet Ruth is, uh, is woven into the lineage, genealogy of the Messiah. You have the death that takes place. This is in, in Moab where it happens. And then uh, Ruth shows a devotion to care for uh, Naomi. And then they find themselves in the fields of Bethlehem. There's been a famine uh, in Israel, which is what sends, them, sends uh, Elimelech, his sons, out of Israel to, uh, to Moab, and uh, it's interesting, the, the irony here, they were in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, literally in Hebrew, uh, is, is house, uh, Bethlehem of bread, okay, the house of bread, and so they, there's a famine in the house of bread, and so they go to Moab, but while they're there, uh, he dies, his two sons, um, Malon and Kilion, die, uh, illness. And so there you have Naomi, Orpah, uh, and, and Ruth, all three uh, without husbands. And by the way, in this, in this setting, in this historical context, that was not a good position to be in. You had very few choices available to you if you were to uh, be, uh, become a widow and not have a male heir who, would, who could grow to carry on the name and care for you. 
And that's their situation. So that's, that's what prompted Naomi to say, I'll go back home. And she really goes back uh, thinking that she's, somehow God has judged her. God has, is angry with her. He's, uh, she's done something to displease him because she loses her husband and her two sons. And so she goes back a, a very grieving widow. Her name takes the name of Mara, which means bitter. Uh, Ruth insists on going with her. And then you have in the second movement, just showing you kind of an of a outline here, uh, Ruth's love rewarded uh, when she meets Boaz, and we'll talk a little more about that, and so, so you see that. The title itself, uh, Ruth, uh, just comes from the, from the lead uh, character. Again, unusual. Think about this. Uh, there are only two books in the Bible named after uh, women. We're going to compare Ruth and Esther when we get to the end of the study tonight. So a book in the Bible is named after someone who is not uh, originally of Jewish extraction. She's a Moabitess. And, but she forsakes her pagan heritage, and she follows her mother-in-law uh, to the people of Israel and to the God of Israel. And God rewards her. She manifests a remarkable, uh, I think they use the term loyalty, a remarkable faithfulness to Naomi, even though, as Naomi was concerned, coming into Bethlehem, not being from there, could work against her very, uh, very tragically. If you've read the, the text, you'll know that when, she's in the, uh, when she goes out into the fields to glean, uh, that Naomi's concerned that she will be assaulted. Exactly, the words actually used, that, that you may be assaulted. And so... When they find out that she's been gleaning in Boaz's field, Naomi says, stay there. You, you'll probably be safe there. Um, the Hebrew title of the book is, is Ruth. Um, the Septuagint just translates literate over right over into, into the Greek, spelled differently, but Ruth, it sounds the same way, and uh, so on for the, for the Latin title. The author. We don't know who the author is. Um, and it's just best to say the author is anonymous. Some suggest it's Samuel, but when you put the timeline together, it really doesn't fit uh, that Samuel could have written this. Um, but Ruth was probably written during the reign of, of David. Uh, Solomon's name is not included in the genealogy. And if, he, if, if Solomon had been born, in all likelihood, you would have seen the book would have ended with his name. Uh, but though it's anonymous... As the folks said in the video, the hand of God is, uh, is clearly there, his providence. The uh, setting begins in, in a place called Moab. Uh, it's a region that's northeast of the Dead Sea. Uh, the Moabites, by the way, were descendants of Lot, and they worshipped Shemosh and other pagan gods. They were not um, monotheists like the Jews. Um, in, in Judges, when we went through Judges, there's a time recorded when, uh, when the Moabites fought against Israel, and we'll see it again in 1 Samuel in chapter 14 where the, they take that up again. There's about a uh, piece of the timeline here. Ruth, uh, the, the story of Ruth takes place about two centuries after the war that's recorded in Judges and about 80 years before the war that's recorded in 1 Samuel that we'll, that we'll see later. Of course, the book opens to give us the context. It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. That's how we know that this happened in the time of the judges. And when you, when you break down the outline I gave you a little while ago, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18 is, is in the country of Moab, about a period of about 10 years. Uh, then the rest of chapter 1 uh, into the end of chapter 2, uh, a few months takes place in the, in the fields. Uh, in Bethlehem, a few months, and then chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 18, all of chapter 3, is a threshing floor in Bethlehem one day, and then chapter 4 uh, takes place for about one year. The theme of, uh, of, of this book contrasted to, uh, to Judges. Remember when we studied Judges, at the end of it, it, it ends with two uh, awful illustrations of, uh, of unrighteousness, immorality in the time of the judges. Ruth comes in as a third illustration 
uh, of life during this time. But it's an illustration of godliness, a great contrast to the, to the state of the, of the day that the judges took place. Uh, it's a picture, a wonderful picture of real faith and obedience. You know, we trust and obey. You've seen that theme of several times now through the books, trust and obey. And it leads to blessing. We've talked about that. If you trust and obey, blessing comes. If you, if you uh, turn away and do not obey, then cursings come. They come out of, the, out of Deuteronomy. We saw that. Uh, Ruth is a, is a refreshing example that Gentiles could believe in the true God. Something that uh, the people of God missed. Uh, the Pharisees missed that. They would make them come through all sorts of ritual to become a, uh, uh, a Jew, proselyte Jew, they would call them. She's a refreshing picture uh, that Gentiles could believe in the true God. And, of course, I think we said to you in anticipation this last week that, that this is the story about how did, how did the Davidic dynasty, how did, the, how did David coming as king. What's the background of that? And this is the background to it. Uh, even though Saul is anointed king first, you have this under, uh, undercurrent that David was designed to be God king. Basically, basically what you're going to see when we get to Samuel and the kings is that God gave the people what they asked. There was, there was a necessity for a king. He gave them what they asked. Give us a king like the rest of the nations have a king. He gave them that in Saul. Then he gave them a king after his own heart, after Saul abdicated the uh, the throne. Now the key, uh, key word, I don't know if this is a new term to you or not, is kinsman redeemer. Uh, the Hebrew word for that is goel, G-O-E-L, the goel, the kinsman redeemer. Uh, as was described in the video, a uh, kinsman redeemer was, was, a, was a near kinsman who, if, a, uh, if the wife of this near kinsman, of, of, his, of his kinsman, died, or was left uh, bereft of a husband, and she did not have a, a male heir, that he would step in and redeem that situation. He would, uh, he would turn it around from being uh, desperate and the woman being destitute. Uh, she would, in all likelihood, if there, were, if there were lands involved, he would step in and purchase the land of his brother, let's say, or his cousin, and he would take that woman to be his wife. Obviously, this gets into some sticky situations where people, like one of our young people today showed me a, a, something somebody sent on Facebook about, you know, you can't, you can't be against uh, gay marriage if you're for polygamy, and the Bible teaches polygamy. It's not that simple. Uh, Genesis 2, 24, God made very plain his plan, his normative plan for relationships. A man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Male, female, one flesh, the two of them. Through these kinds of circumstances, where the cultural uh, norms would leave someone uh, vulnerable and destitute, this is, this is one of the ways, practical ways they worked out to care for uh, the widow, was to take her in. Uh, hopefully father children by her so that she would have a male heir, and then the name of the family would go on. They would not be ashamed. They would not be embarrassed. They would not feel judged by God. And someone would rise, would grow up, and, and then as he moved toward adulthood, would take care of his mother and take care of those in the family. And that's what's going on here. And so uh, the kinsman redeemer. Look at, look at Ruth uh, 1, 16. Ruth said, uh, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. This is her speaking to Naomi, of course. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. That's a pivotal turn. Had she, had she gone the way of Orpah, just stayed in Moab, we'd have never heard about Ruth. But in God's providence, that was not the plan. That she, would, she was going to follow Naomi. And Naomi, who felt cursed, would experience an incredible blessing through Ruth's decision go with her mother-in-law uh, to Bethlehem. And then chapter 3, verse 11, And now, my daughter, do not fear. 
I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you're a worthy woman. This is, this is Boaz speaking to her in chapter 3, telling her she has no need to fear that he will uh, provide all that she needs. And he does so, by the way. If you read the book, uh, she goes out to the threshing floor. And, the, and again, one of the practices they had to take care of the poor, uh, the gleaners were told to just sort of reap uh, in the main area and leave the corners of the field, even though they, they would cut those down to not, to not pick up those grains, to leave those in the corners of the field for the, uh, for the poor, uh, widows and things like that to come and glean for themselves. And so there was, there was always, if, if there was a harvest, there was always food for those who did not reap there. It's one of the principles in Israel, to care for its own. And so uh, that's what she's doing. She's, she's doing this so that she and Naomi will not starve to death. There's no one to take care of them. There was no welfare society then that you could count on the government to do. This was, this was the people of God looking after uh, one another. And so she does that, and that's how she encounters Boaz. And, of course, if you read the story, uh, when Boaz finds out what she's doing and who she is, he says, you don't need to reap from the corners. I'll tell my young men that as they're reaping th through the main area to leave some for you to come behind them, and so she goes away at one point with, I think the number was, was like three-fifths of a bushel, which is about 22 liters of grain. It's incredible what she brings back to Naomi. They're, they're hoping they can just get a handful to make it last. She comes back with this, with this abundance of grain. And she, again, she goes to Boaz and comes back with, uh, with a meal. He has her, a meal prepared for her and has her sit at his table. So she not only carries back grain, he, says, he loads up her cloak with it, but she comes back with the remainder of a meal that she had for, for uh, Naomi to eat. It's just remarkable when you see the, the kindness of this. The, the, the uh, key chapter is, of course, chapter 4, where, this, where you see the enactment of the fleshing out. You have this a nearer, a nearer kinsman than Boaz. Notice what a man of integrity Boaz is. He makes a commitment to take her. There's some, there's some strange uh, cultural happenings here. He's, a, he's asleep on the threshing floor, having had a hard day in the fields. He's, he's, he's had a little wine, so he's not drunk, but he's, uh, he's happy. And, uh, and so he's asleep, and, and uh, Naomi says, Go, get yourself dressed up, and go to where Boaz is at the threshing floor. Yeah, that's where you'll find him. And lie down at his feet. Uh, and see what happens. Now, Naomi is not promoting immorality here. Uh, the custom was that, that if a strange woman did that, a, a wicked man would take advantage of her. In fact, if you read Hosea, I think it's Hosea 9, 1, Hosea uh, chides the people for the immorality taking place at the threshing floor. But a righteous man would not do that. And Boaz is a man of integrity. Uh, what Naomi hopes is that he will, he will see Ruth there. Uh, will again be reminded of the need of compassion that she and the family have. And would act. And so Ruth is actually instructed by Naomi to, she says to him, spread your wings over me. Which is, again, that's not an enticement to immorality. That's, that's an appeal. I want to read to you uh, Ezekiel. I came across this. I thought this was... Pretty fascinating. Ezekiel 16.8. Uh, Listen to this. This is God speaking to his people through the prophet Ezekiel. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God. And you became mine. It's, it, that was the symbol. So when she says, spread your, your wings over me, she's make, basically saying, would you marry me? He agrees to, and then he finds out that there's a, a nearer kinsman. And so he says, we need to address that. If, if he says he will redeem you, in other words, if he will commit to be engaged to you, buy your land, and, and marry you, then, then I won't. Again, the integrity of the man is incredible. So the nearer kinsman, Boaz, encounters him and sits down and says, here's, here's what's going on. We have a relative, uh, Naomi. She's come back and she has a daughter, Ruth, and, and she needs someone to marry. You need to redeem her. 
Well, all the man hears is they've got property. And he says, I'll do that. And so <laughs> when Boaz says, okay, you buy their property, and you'll marry uh, Ruth's, or marry Naomi's daughter-in-law. And he says, oh, no, I can't, I can't marry the daughter-in-law. That'll, that'll mess up my inheritance plans. And so when he turns that down, and by the way, there's a, uh, we'll look at this, I think, in a, in a few minutes. There's a, in uh, Deuteronomy, that instructs you that when you go and ask someone to practice the role of kinsman redeemer, and they don't do it, they refuse to do it, then, of course, you go to the next near kinsman. But that person, you take your sandal off and, and hit them with it. And this happens sort of in a public setting. And they, they come to be known as the fellow who got hit with a, with a sandal. Uh, that sort of becomes their identity. So it was, it was a real embarrassment not to be willing to fulfill this, or to, to be willing to leave a family member vulnerable. We'll, we'll look at that a little, uh, perhaps, in a little bit. So you have this, chapter 4 takes in this, the, the, the example of the whole law of the Goel, the law of the kinsman redeemer. What about Christ and Ruth? The, the, the video said, the narrator, the, the author, does not mention God. And it's because of this, by the way, that, that when, when the discussion was underway for what books to be included in the canon of Scripture, the 66 books that we now have, there was a huge debate about, about Ruth, whether or not it belonged, because it, was not, it did not seem to be driven by this clear identity of Yahweh. Uh, but thank the Lord, uh, the debate went on, and, and the inclusion of Ruth prevailed because, as the, as the video stated, and as we're telling you here, the hand of God's providence is clearly upon uh, Ruth declares, your God will be my God. And so there's no question about who they're talking about there. But the, but the author of the book does not, as, is, as we found so previously, highlight uh, the being of God, the God of Israel. Um, so how do you see Christ? Well, you see Christ in Ruth through this image of the kinsman redeemer. Let's look at some passages together. Just I want to weave some things together for you here. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He agreed in the, in the covenant of redemption in eternity to come in the fullness of time and to become one of us, free from sin, and take our place, redeem us. We looked at this morning, purchase us. Uh, from the auction block of sin. Look at Deuteronomy 25, 5. We're just going to read some passages here together. Uh, this is teaching that if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. There's the principle. Slated. Now read on down and what happens if he doesn't. Verse 7 to 10. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then the brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And then she shall answer, say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. So it's a public humiliation of a man who turns down the, the role of kinsman redeemer. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. So that's the background to it, the biblical background. What do we see Jesus in that? Well, look at John 1, 14. The word became flesh, you know this passage, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory is of one... Uh, only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He comes to be one of us. We're going to look at these, these lessons here of kinsman redeemer. We're going to set the, set the tone biblically. Romans 1, 3. Paul says, concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. So Jesus uh, is, is the descendant of David. He is the one who would sit on the throne, on David's throne. And he has come uh, to, to take us at the point of our need. And care for us. We remember the prophet, priest, and king to rule over us and defend us. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. 
Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He took, the point here is the incarnation. In the incarnation, Jesus comes to be one of us, one among us, to function as our goel. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since therefore the children of share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Uh, this is his role. He is related by blood to those he redeems as one of us. Second thing he does is he's, he's able to pay the price of redemption. I look at Ruth uh, 2, 1, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Ruth 2, 1 says, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man, a virtuous man, of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Peter says this. We read this this morning. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He's, he's able to pay the redemption price. Think about that. You and I couldn't pay the price for our own redemption. No one of us could pay the price for someone else's redemption. There was only one who could do that. And Jesus comes as, as our goel. The third thing is he needs to be willing to redeem. We see that uh, in Deuteronomy, if he, what happens if he's not. Ruth 3.11, and now my, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. There's, there's Boaz assuring her he's going to do the right thing on her behalf. Matthew 20, 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He was willing. He willingly laid down his life. Uh, John 10, uh, 15, Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And then again in, in verse 18 of chapter 10 of John, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So here you, this, this willingness... He did not begrudgingly, Jesus did not begrudgingly come out of heaven to redeem us. He did so willingly. And then Hebrews 10, 7, which is a messianic, uh, then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Then the fourth requirement, if you please, he has to be free himself. Uh, the note there that Jesus was free from the curse of sin. Uh, he was perfect. He never sinned. He was in a unique position to purchase those of us out of our sin because he himself was not. This term goel is used 13 times in the book of Ruth. Think about that. 13 times in these four short chapters. And so when you read it with those lenses, when you know what a kinsman redeemer is, you know what a goel is, you understand that the, that the book, the value of the book, there's several values, but one of them is that it gives us a powerful uh, portrait of Jesus Christ, the love he has for us and what he did for us as kinsmen. You, you could say that Jesus is our, in the spiritual sense, Jesus is our Boaz. He's our Boaz. And then what about the contribution of, of the book uh, to the canon of Scripture? Well, we can see it from several angles. In terms of literary form, it's simple but profound. Uh, it's a wonderful story of love uh, and, and piety. From the historical vantage point, there's the bridge. Br judges forms that, we said that, but R Ruth, the story within the times of the judges, actually identifies the one who will typify the monarchy, uh, David. And then, of course, the contrast of faithfulness and infidelity. Uh, doctrinal uh, should be obvious. Gentiles are not outside the scope of redemption. The prophets preach this. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, they, they missed it or, or refused to see it. And then moral. This, uh, when, you, when you weave through the strange customs, from sleeping at the feet of someone who's lying asleep on the threshing floor, Ask him to spread his wings. When you, when you weave through to understand what's going on there, uh, there's a lot of integrity in relationships and marriage. What about Ruth and Esther? Let's compare them, contrast them. 
Ruth is a Gentile woman. Esther is a Jewish woman. Ruth lives among the Jews. Esther lived among the Gentiles. Ruth married a Jewish man who would, in the royal line of David. Esther married a Gentile man who ruled an empire. Ruth is a story of faith and blessing, and Esther is a story of faith and blessing. These two books named after these ladies are incredible contributions to uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, let's contrast Ruth, Judges. The day of the Judges, Ruth is in the middle of that. Ruth is a, is a model for us of fidelity, righteousness, and purity. The Judges, immorality. Ruth shows the, the power of following the true God. The Judges show us the, the tragedy of idolatry. Ruth manifests devotion to God and to the people of God. Judges shows us decline, debasement, disloyalty. Ruth is all about love. Judges, when you, when you encounter anything amorous, it's about lust. Ruth is a wonderful story of, of the peace of God upon a situation. Judges is about war. Ruth is full of kindness and models kindness for us. Boaz models kindness for us. The judges, a lot of cruelty. Ruth, again, is an example that obedient faith leads to blessing. That's a theme you're going to see all through the Old Testament and even into the New. The judges show that disobedience leads to sorrow. Ruth is a, is a we said oasis at the beginning. Ruth is a place of spiritual light in the midst of spiritual darkness. Ruth is like the uh, land of Goshen, if you remember when we looked at Exodus. And all the plagues were befalling uh, the e Egyptians. That when it went completely dark in Egypt, there was still light in the land of Goshen with this, this uh, ghetto, if you please, where they put the Jewish slave population. Ruth is, uh, is light in the midst of a culture and a, and a time in history when it was incredibly dark. We describe Judges as, as, a, as a period of dark ages under the theocracy. So that's kind of a, it's a shorter book, so it doesn't take us as long to get through it. Uh, I would entertain any questions or comments or observations before we wrap up tonight.